welcome to another Docker tutorial. In today's tutorial, we are going to go over building a container using a Docker file. And what a Docker file is, is it's essentially a, a set of instructions that we're going to use to apply to a base image that we've already created that will allow us to be able to build an application container out and have a repeatable process so that if we ever want to modify that container, maybe by issuing updates or, you know, maybe putting a new uh, version of the application or making modifications, you know, to that installation base or to that uh, application install or anything, then we could quickly and easily rebuild the entire container from scratch uh, in exactly the same way that it was built previously. And there's also some integration or some continuous integration benefits that we get. Um, so I'll kind of walk through this workflow from start to finish so that we kind of get an idea as to how this whole thing kind of molds together and how it works and how it's more beneficial than just spinning up a raw base container and, you know, doing your, your application installation and then committing your container, which you absolutely can do. But the only problem with that is, is that there's no documentation necessarily involved with that creation process. So when you go through and you just spin up a raw container and then you, you know, install your app and maybe make modifications, change some permissions, do this, do that. Um, that's that's absolutely fine, but if something happens to that container and you have to rebuild it, you may not rebuild it exactly the same way, or you might not remember what you did to build that container. Maybe the application install was you know a little bit hefty, or a little bit complicated, kind of like um, you know a couple of the applications that that we we have installed. Uh, it can you know be a half an hour to a hour long installation process. And what this will do is this will give you the ability to just fire off a new build and you know kind of walk away, let it build itself and it'll be exactly the same as it was before or any previous version that we used before. What I'm gonna do here is we have gone over creating a base image uh, in a previous tutorial and uh, one of the steps that I did after creating that base image was that I did create a a uh, Docker Hub account and I have um, pushed my images up to the Docker Hub. So, um, so for instance, this, this Ceno 6.5 here is the base image that we're going to be using. Um, it's actually the image that we created in the other tutorial video. It is just literally a raw installation of Ceno 6.5 and then I further modified it by just adding a couple of packages here um, like NetTools and Vim. I, I have to have my Vim. Uh, Wget, OpenSSH, uh, screen, yum utils, tar, NTP, things like that. So I kind of pushed that stuff into the raw base image. Um, I added a couple of repositories like the Remy repository, the Postgres repository, and the uh, EPL repository. Um, I changed some SSH options, although I don't enable SSH in my containers. But if I do in the future, or if I have a container that I want to enable SSH on, those options are already going to be set. Um, I turned off SE Linux. Um, I turned off IP tables and basically set up NTP, and then uh, I, I uh, set a couple of services to start on boot. And with Docker containers, your start service or, or your check config doesn't work because the container is accessed slightly differently than a regular box. So instead, what I did was I just echo a service start command to the bash RC. And so whenever that container is started up, it's going to run through any of the commands that are located in the bash RC file, and it'll fire those services up. So um, I got my, you know, NTP, my syslog, and my cron, um, all that get fired up every single time one of my containers starts up. Um, and then I, I just obviously updated it to get all of the security updates and all of the regular updates. And then I did some cleanup, so I uh, removed all the RPMs that I had downloaded, uh, primarily being the EPL and Remy RPMs, and then I also removed the entire var cache directory, which is about 100, 100, get, uh, 100 megs or so. Um, and the reason why I did that was obviously because I want to get that base image down um, as small as I possibly can. Um, already, it's, it is kind of big. Um, I do put the, uh, the size. This particular uh, container fully modified is about 424 megabytes, which is not overly huge, but it is still pretty big as far as a base is concerned. I mean, that's, that's what we're starting off with. So um, I do have a plan to try to move some of this stuff over to BusyBox. Uh, at some point when I get some time, um, BusyBox images can be built with 50 meg, 100 meg, 200 meg, like really super small, which makes it just a whole lot more portable. But um, that will be a whole other tutorial once I figure out that process and, and uh, have a little bit of success with it. Another thing that I just kind of wanted to point out is uh, before we get started here, once we create our Docker file, and by creating a Docker file, um, we're not only going to create the Docker file, but we may also have some, some files that... Uh, 
are kind of like support files. So for instance, if I want to do certain things once the container starts up, I might have like a run script, which I, I actually do have in a lot of my containers um, to kind of just set some things up and do some customizations. Um, I might have an RPM uh, that, you know, I want to stick to a specific version. So I, you know, will will download the RPM and include that RPM in, in uh, the Docker installation or along with my Docker file. Um, I might have a, uh, a zip file or, you know, an application tarball that I've downloaded. Um, there could just be, you know, different maybe config files that I've already pre-set up. Like all these things, they can kind of go in the same directory as your Docker file. And then you're going to want to kind of have a place to store this stuff, right? So what I would recommend here is that in addition to uh, setting up a Docker Hub account, if you don't already have one, um, go to Bitbucket or go to GitHub and uh, go ahead and create an account. And once you're in there and you create an account, you can start uh, stacking these things um, as repositories. So for instance, um, let's say the PrestaShop uh, Docker image that I've already built, um, this is gonna create my, my, my uh, readme MD, so it's gonna kind of give me an option. Um, again, when I create my Docker files, uh, I do create my, my containers with a lot of customizable images, so you can kind of pass in variables and you know really customize it right from the run line without having to go in after the container is running and tweak all these options and restart it and I don't want to do any of that stuff I want to just be able to spin up a container have it set for a domain have you know my, my root passwords and my MySQL passwords and all that stuff already set um, and I don't want to have to modify any of that I literally just want to run a single command have my image up and running and go so um, you know because of that I, I definitely have a couple of uh, support files. Um, so, like, if you look inside of my repository for this PrestaShop image, for example, I've got my main Docker file. Um, I've got a uh, a Docker up script, which is just a script that'll ask you a couple of questions if you don't want to, you know, feed in those command line environment variables uh, by manually. Um, I've got uh, a MySQL setup, so a, a script that's already ran to run through a MySQL uh, startup. Um, I've actually got the Apache config file for PrestaShop. Um, I've got the actual PrestaShop zip file, um, the README, and that run script that I was just talking about that performs you know X number of actions uh, when it starts up. And and we're not going to go into uh, a Docker file setup quite this advanced quite yet. Um, you know we're just going to kind of start small and kind of work through it. Uh, but you know I just wanted to kind of from the get go put the idea in your head that you know you might want to have a repository that's going to contain all of your uh, Docker files. And another advantage of doing that is that back on the Docker Hub, um, if you look back on you know your your main page once you create the account and you go to uh, you have a Add Repository button up here. If you click on Add Repository, um, it will actually give you the ability to be able to add a reposit repository build. I'm sorry. So actually, I want to go automated build here. Um, but you can set up an automated build, and what an automated build is, is that it will actually link up to your Bitbucket account. So um, I actually have a good number of these images already, like this PrestaShop image right here, which is the one that we just looked at. Um, I actually have this set up as an automated build, and what that means is it's linked to my Bitbucket account, and um, what it does is it monitors for any changes to my Bitbucket code. So what, what I can do now is I can do a git clone and actually pull down the entire Docker file project for my PrestaShop image. I can make alter, uh, alterations, modifications, maybe change variables, um, change the version, just modify in, in any way that I, I want or need to. And then I just go ahead and commit that code back up to Bitbucket. And because there's a hook from the Docker hub into my Bitbucket, Docker Hub will actually sense that there's been a change to my code and it will automatically kick off a brand new build. So I don't even have to manually build the containers. Um, the containers will get automatically built on the Docker Hub. And that's kind of like a, you know, a continuous integration feature that is absolutely time saving and it's it's awesome. Um, just because I can, you know, make the modifications, kick off a build, and you know, I don't have to like go through that process, re-upload the image, do all that stuff. It's just, you know, automatically happening as soon as I do my code commit. Um, another uh, repository that I did want to mention is uh, quay.io. Whoops, not quail. I don't want quail ridge rock. I want quail.quay.io. 
And what Quaya.io is, is uh, it's actually another repository, um, kind of like the Docker Hub that was set up, and it's actually been purchased by CoreOS. And this is actually really cool. It's got a couple of features that Docker Hub does not have, but there are also a couple of features missing that Docker Hub has. So um, like the, the dashboard when you log in, I don't really like it. It's not really all about you. It's kind of like a shared space. Um, but what, one of the features that it does let you do is if I don't want to hook up to a uh, code repository, I can actually just tar up my whole project and feed it a tar file, and it will create a, a Docker build off that tar file, which is kind of nice. So, um, and it also kind of gives me a nice graph. I don't, I'm not logged in here, but um, gives me a nice graph of uh, of the project, and I can actually show you that here real quick. Let me let me just move this over here so I can log in. Okay, and so I'm logged in. So like when you log into Quay.io. Um, you know, it kind of shows you your repositories, um, but uh, what, what you want to do here is just go to your repository, so that way you can see just your stuff. Um, however, still, it's not all about you, This is, and this is the thing I kind of don't like. I feel like my dashboard should just be all my stuff, kind of like it is, um, you know, here on the on the Docker Hub. If I just go to my main um, my main dashboard, I mean, it's, it's all about me, stuff that, you know, my summary, my repositories, stuff that I've starred. Um, you know, private repositories, you know, things that I like, and then it kind of gives me a news feed or an event feed on just my stuff. And Quay doesn't do that. It, it kind of gives you a list of your, you know, your repositories, but then it's like top public. This is all stuff that I haven't even looked at and I don't really care about because um, I'm in here to do something. So, um, but that's fine. Like, again, if I look at my, you know, same Presta Shop image here or container, um, the layout's the same. I've got my, you know, my MD or my readme.md file, but what's nice is down here, it kind of gives me a timeline uh, as to my, you know, my builds. And I'm going to explain what all this stuff is because we're going to see this during the build process and what these numbers mean. But um, this makes it really nice because it, it actually will give me, you know, command for command the things that I've done in order to build this image. Um, so I can go back and I can reference it. And so I, I do really like that. And if I, like I said, if I want to build a, a new image, um, I can actually just supply the tar file, which has, you know, all my stuff tarred up and I don't have to link it to a, a repository. Although I do like the linking personally. Um, I like to commit code and just have it build. But um, so enough about that. Um, let's go ahead and uh, get started here. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, starting up our boot to Docker. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a um, uh, directory. I'm just going to create a, a brand new directory. And um, I'm going to create a new directory that is going to contain all the, the Docker files or the, the build files that I'm going to need in order to create this image. So um, let's just go into my documents and I'll just do a uh, make dir. Um, let's see. Users are nascent documents. Uh, Docker demo and cd into that directory okay and I have nothing in here so I'm gonna create a brand new file called uh, docker file and I do want to create it with a capital D because um, that's it that is the format and so I've got the docker file here and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off and I'm gonna put in a couple of things like the first thing that I want to do is um, I usually kind of put like a comment and just kind of you know state what the, the, the purpose of this particular uh, build file is going to be for. So um, let's go ahead and just uh, say this is a, um, let's just throw a couple of, of comment lines in here and I'm going to do a WordPress uh, Docker file. Or we'll just say WordPress installation and then kind of throw some more comments in there all right and the first thing that I need to do is I need to uh, set the base image um, and so I'm gonna set that from and I'm gonna put in my case app containers slash seno 65 Okay, and what that's going to do is that's just going to simply tell that to, it's going to tell Docker that when it starts to build this image that I want to go to the Docker Hub and I want to pull 
um, the app container slash Seno 6.5 image, which is the base image that I've created. So obviously, if you've created your own base image here, um, this is going to be the account that you use when you sign up to Docker Hub. Uh, you will use that space and then your image name, however you saved it. Or if you're running a private repository, um, you know, it could be registry.yourdomain.local, port 5000 slash, and then set, you know, then the image name. So you just need to specify a base. How is this thing going to, uh, how is it going to be built or what's the base image that's going to be used um, or that it's going to use to, to build. Now, if I don't want to use an image here, I can just write in the word scratch and I can just say from scratch, meaning like just build this thing like with nothing. Um, but I obviously want to have, you know, my Seno 65, so I'm going to I'm going to use my Seno 65 image. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set the maintainer. We'll just say file author and maintainer. And I'm going to set that as myself okay and I would usually just put my name here or whatever um, but basically what this is gonna do is just that way if anybody finds your docker file maybe on the hub or something like that and you know they maybe have a question or something like that about uh, something that you've done in there um, they have a way to contact you so um, I always put that in all my docker files um, they're, it's not necessarily important the from is definitely important but maintainer is not necessarily um, just good practice what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start off, you know, kind of from the base how I would build this thing out. And so if I was building this out, um, you know, from scratch, I, I, I had like a VM or a, a, even a container sitting in front of me and I was at the command line and I was just, you know, building this thing using, you know, normal CLI stuff. Um, the first thing I would do is I, I wouldn't know maybe necessarily how old the image is. So I want to update it. I want to have a fully updated uh, installation. So I'm going to set up a prereqs section. And in that prereq, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use run is going to be the statement that I use in order to actually run a command inside of the build uh, session here. So I'm going to run uh, yum clean all. And then I'm going to say and and I'm going to put basically a spacer here so I can go to the next line. And this is all still under the same run. Yum uh, dash y update we want to definitely make sure that we specify the dash y so that it's automatic and we don't have to you know answer the question and then what I'm also going to do after that that update is I'm going to do a remove force recursive uh, slash var slash cache slash star now let me explain a couple of things now What's going to happen when we actually run this file? Okay, it's going to have we're going to have a container that's going to be the base container that we've already created. When the Docker file is ran, each one of these run statements is going to be a run operation. And what Docker does for a run operation is it takes that base container, it's going to spin it up and start it. It's going to apply what's in the run statement. Then it's going to commit that into a new container and it's going to and it's going to store it right. And so then the next run line, it will take that previous container that's no longer the base. It's now a modified container. It will spin that one up, apply the new run statement, and then commit it and, you know, make another one. And so that's what kind of builds your um, your tree, right? So your, your, your actual container tree. And it gives you the ability to kind of roll back and it does some caching stuff. And um, there's a lot of advantages to, you know, as to why it, it does this way. Or does it this way however that being said I don't want a billion different levels to my container and so that's why I'm combining all of these yum based statements into one statement using the the ampersand symbol here now if I wanted to I could put these all on one line as well um, I just like to you know I like to keep my stuff neat um, but if I didn't want to have them on, you know, if I wanted it all on the same line, then I would just omit that slash. That slash that I'm putting just says, hey, like, ignore the carriage return and, you know, run, like, like basically keep what's on the next line as part of this one this one run command. So, um, I mean, I could absolutely do it this way. Um, but like I said, I like to keep things clean. And also, a thing to note here, um, when you're building these, 
like let's say I did put these into three separate uh, run statements, I also have to understand that the way that this works, because it's building a new container for every run step, okay, anything that we do to that container, because it has to keep that revision history, um, it's going to store that inside of the, the image, which is going to affect the overall size. So what I mean by that is like, let's say that if I, if I put these three these three run statements or these three commands in the same um, in the same I'm sorry in different run lines right so what would happen would be the first thing is it would do a yum clean all okay that's probably like a zero byte operation it doesn't really like add anything to the file system right but then I do a yum update and so what does the yum update do that goes out and it grabs the Remy repository it grabs you know the the uh, EPO repository it grabs the Senos base repository it grabs whatever repositories that you have and it pulls all that stuff down okay and it puts it in the cache right and so it that is, I will tell you from experience, about 100 to 150 megabytes, which is not, you know, a whole lot, but it's still a good chunk. And so it will, you know, do that run, and then it will um, actually update whatever packages that you have, you know, that need to be updated, and then it will, again, take that, that container, commit it, and store it. Then the next line will be a, you know, remove cache. Well, now it will, again, spin up that container, it will remove the cache, which will which will remove that 150 megabytes, um, and then it will again commit that container and and store it. Now the problem is is that because that's three different lines, and we have to keep continuity in the image, and we have to keep a revision history, that 150 megabytes for the yum update statement is still going to be baked into your image because I may want to roll back to that point, right? So it really does us no good at that point to even clear the cache because that 150 megabytes is still going to be in inside of the, the image size, right? So right now I started off with, what, 464 megabytes. I just added 150. I'm already up to almost 600 megabytes for my image size, right? So that's why that's another reason why I'm doing this all in one statement. If I do it in one statement, then I, I achieve my overall goal of saving space and still completing the operation. In one statement, I'm going to do a yum clean all, zero byte. I'm going to do a yum update, which is going to go ahead and pull all the repositories and add that 150 megabytes to the image. But then I'm going to immediately remove the cache, which is going to delete that 150 megabytes. And then it's going to go ahead and commit the image and, and use that new committed image for the, for the uh, next run statement. Right. So I've saved because I, I added but then deleted that 150 megabytes all in the same run line. Right. So before it wasn't between commits, it was all as part of the same the same change that got committed. So um, as you're writing your Docker files, you want to kind of keep that stuff in mind so that you can kind of optimize the image size of your image and keep it nice and small and manageable. Um, so that all being said, let's go ahead and continue on here with our installation. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do after the uh, prerequisites is we're going to actually install the application. So application install. And what we're going to do for this is going to be another run. And we're going to wget dash p slash var. In the, slash, the, slash, the dash p is just where I want to put it. So I'm going to wget a file and I want to put it in a specific location. And in this case, I want to put it in www slash html slash and I'm gonna grab it from https wordpress.org slash latest dot zip okay and then I'm gonna append another one I'm gonna actually unzip it as well in the same statement so unzip var www html latest dot zip dash d which is the destination var www html slash and last I want to remove that zip file right gotta clean up after myself okay now here there are gonna be a couple of little complexities um, we're not gonna make it as complicated as you know as we can or maybe I'll just I'll show you um, so that you can you know kind of go through this. I don't want to make this a two-hour tutorial. Um, like with any installation, there's going to be additional components. Like so, um, for instance, we will set up the uh, let's we'll do MySQL as well. Um, so that means we'll actually have to kind of modify this a little bit because we're going to have to add MySQL to this um, because obviously WordPress requires MySQL or Postgres in order to be able to run. 
Um, but there is some uh, at the end of all this. I'm gonna we're gonna set this up just very generically so that that way you have an understanding as to you know what this does and how it works. Um, and then I'll just kind of like as an as an end kind of give you some tips and show you like how you can kind of customize it and what I, some of the tricks that I do in order to customize it. So. Um, so let's go back up here. I'm actually going to go back to my prereq section real quick. And after my update, um, I'm going to have to go ahead and do a yum y, and I'm going to do an install for a couple of packages that we're going to need in order to run WordPress. Um, so what I'm going to need is HTTPD, which is going to be Apache. I'm going to need mod rewrite. I'm going to need mod SSL in case I want to do SSL on that uh, particular page. Um, I'm going to just put it in here. Uh, we need this mod env and what that is is that we can basically do variable substitution within our Apache config file, which is really helpful for customization. So um, I always add that. We're gonna we're gonna keep that in there, and then I'm gonna add PHP, uh, PHP common, uh, PHP CLI, PHP MySQL, uh, MySQL server, and unzip. Okay, so those are the additional packages. In addition to what we already have installed, those are the packages that I want to install. So, um, all right, so now we've gone back down here. Uh, we've installed or we've gone through the step of installing our application. Um, I'm going to, let's see, we're going to need to do a couple of things. We're going to need to set up a WP config file, um, which we can actually just make a copy of that. So, what we'll do is do a run and we're going to copy. Inside of the installation for WordPress, there already is a sample wp-config file. So we're just going to copy that. Dash sample dot php, and I, I'm 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 able to just realize or remember where all this stuff is simply because well, one, it's all in the WordPress documentation, and two, um, you know. I've done this a couple of times <laughs> with WordPress, so um, and I've obviously built this uh, this container already. I've built this um, a lot more customized than we're going here, but uh, I figured this was the easiest example to kind of show you. So, um, all right, so and then we're going to copy that to var www uh, html uh, wordpress wp config dot php. Okay. And we'll just put a little statement in here. Copy the wp config file. All right. And uh, let's see. The next thing we need to do is uh, we're going to set up exposed ports. So I'm going to say expose necessary ports. And I'm going to use the expose command. And what that is going to do is it's going to basically tell the container to allow other things like other containers to access this container on port 80. So there are two levels of expose. Um, there's expose and publish. Expose is allowing other containers to be able to access the, this container on the port that you're exposing. A publish is going to take and actually bind the exposed port on the host. So on the host... Um, we, we're actually going to, you know, put a statement in there that's going to be like a dash p eighty colon eighty, and what that's going to do is say, I want to bind the host, or the, the the core OS, or you know Ubuntu, or whatever you're using for the the actual host boot to Docker in this case. Um, I want to expo expose the boot to Docker IP on port eighty. I want to publish, you know, any requests that come in to that port straight through to this container. Okay, so I'm going to expose port eighty. And um, that kind of gives us a base, right? So um, we would be able to build this, but we do need to put in the MySQL part, right? So at this point, um, we've got MySQL server here. It, it will install via yum once we're all set, but we need to set that up a little bit, right? So um, that's where we're going to have to kind of create another script. And we also need to have an Apache config file so that it actually gets served, okay? So we're going to have a couple of external files here that we need to create. Um, so let's go ahead and do that, and we can open this back up and kind of append the Docker file as we need to. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and save that file, okay? And I'm going to need to create a new file. And so the new file that I'm going to create is going to be a, uh, let's do the MySQL setup script first, okay? Because that's, that's really easy. 
So we're going to do a uh, vim mysql setup dot sql script. And this is just going to be a simple sql script. So inside of the sql script, I am going to uh, first set my root password. So I'm going to say set password for, and these are all just sql commands. So this is nothing, uh, nothing crazy. And I'm going to say uh, for root at localhost equals password and we'll just uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have this as password okay and then we will create our database so let's do create database and we'll call it WordPress and we got to make sure that we put our semicolons at the end here otherwise the SQL script will fail so we don't want that and then we need to do a grant for permissions. So we're going to say grant all privileges, privileges on WordPress dot star to uh, WordPress. Let's just do WP user at localhost. Identified, identified by uh, let's just do again password. Okay. All right. And then uh, I also like to just drop the test database just to get it out of there. So um, database test. Okay. And that's it. So all we're doing is setting the root password creating the database, setting the grant for the database. Super easy, okay? And then we're gonna save it. Now, now we have an additional file here inside of our directory. We need to actually include that in the container, right? So we need this MySQL setup file to actually be ported into the container or added to the container and ran inside of the container, right? So I wanna add that. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that and we're gonna open up the Docker file again. And what I'm gonna do here is up above, uh, Prereqs. I'm just going to add a new section, and I'm going to say files that need to be added, and I'm going to use the add command to simply add that file, okay, to the temp directory, okay. And now there is a, a little caveat here. You'll notice that you'll notice that I put a ending slash on here. I definitely want to do that. Um, However, if I did a directory, you can do a directory. So I could have like, let's say, um, for instance, a good example is RPMs. If there's ever an RPM that I want to lock down to a specific version, inside of the folder where my Docker file is, I'll actually create a, um, a RPMs directory, okay? And I might just want to include or copy everything um, that's in that RPMs directory into my container. And in that case, if I'm doing a directory, my add statement would be like add RPMs, right, to just slash temp. And that would work, okay? It's a little weird. I don't know why I got to put the, the you know ending uh, slash when I'm just doing a file, but um, it is what it is. So I'm going to add that, and we're going to just go ahead and quit that. And now the next thing I'm going to need is I'm going to actually need a an actual config file, an Apache config file, okay? So let's go ahead and create an Apache config file real quick. And I'm just going to call this thing uh, just WordPress.conf. Whoops. And it's just going to be, again, a standard Apache config file. So this is not going to be anything uh, anything crazy. I'm going to just create a quick virtual host. And we'll do a star.80. And we'll set our document root. To var www.html, and we named it WordPress. Want that ending slash in there. And then we'll set the server name. And we'll just set it to WordPress.local. It's fine. It doesn't really, not too, too important. 
Um, we can also set server aliases if we, if we want to. Um, so if you know, like, that you might want it as, I don't know, W, whoops, not server name, server alias, as www.wordpress.local. Let's go ahead and do that. It's good form. And we'll set the error log. To var log HTTPD or HTTP yeah, D slash WordPress underscore error dot log and our access or custom log will be var log HTTPD uh, WordPress access.log combined and that's pretty much it so that's our Apache config file should be good to go so let's go ahead and save that and again we've got to add that to our docker file so let's copy that and in this case, I'm not going to put this in the temp. Um, I'm just going to add this. Let's see if I actually move. Now we got to go in sequence here, right? So um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to I'm going to copy this just to save an operation, and I'm going to remove all this, and I'm going to move it below the prereqs. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because in the prereqs section is where we actually install Apache, right? So if I move it below, I can actually Oops. Um, I can actually move it instead of just moving it to the temp directory. I'll be able to move it directly to etsy httpd conf.d. Okay. So that way it just saves me uh, an operation later on. All right. So now we've got that added. So we've got our Apache config file. Um, we've got our uh, MySQL script. Um, and now we really just need to run the MySQL script, right? So I actually can do that inside of the Docker file again. Um, I'm going to go down here and let's see, we've copied. Um, we also need to modify this so that the, uh, so the WP config file um, will be able to access the database. So first let's go ahead and spin up the database. And the way I'm going to do that is just going to be a run uh, service MySQL D start and then I'm going to need to go ahead and run that script okay and the way I'm going to do that is let's see I'm just going to do a MySQL import to and I'm going to run temp uh, MySQL setup dot SQL and that's just going to basically feed that script into MySQL and then I'm going to remove temp MySQL setup dot star. And the reason I'm going to do dot star is because um, it'll actually create a SQLE uh, file in there. So I just kind of, if I do that, it gets rid of everything. And again, I definitely want to do this all in one statement. And the reason being is because, again, you have to remember that we... Um, you know, for each one of these raw operations, it's spinning up a container, then stopping the container, and then uh, committing the container. So if I do this in separate run statements, what will happen is if I do a service MySQL D start, it'll start MySQL, and then the container will shut down, which will effectively shut down the MySQL service. So then when I do the second line, run MySQL import, that's not going to work because the MySQL daemon is no longer running. So I definitely have to do all this in, in one shot. Uh, start MySQL, feed in the script remove the file, and then last, I'm going to go ahead and just stop MySQL. Okay. So now um, the, the way this is looking is that we're going to uh, go ahead and install our stuff. We're going to um, add the MySQL setup file and the wordpress.comp file. Then we're going to uh, go ahead and grab the ap actual application, unzip it, put it in place, and then we're going to set up our database and then we're going to copy the file over. But now after we copy the file over, um, we're going to need to actually modify that file. Okay. 
and uh, let's see if I can show you real quick. I'm going to show you what what a let's see if I can get, pull up an example here real quick of the WP config file. Okay, so the WP config file it kind of looks uh, here's an example right here. Um, there's got a bunch of stuff in there, but the thing that we are primarily concerned about here is going to be this stuff right here. Okay, um, the MySQL settings. So now I can I can go ahead and I could build this uh, container right now if I wanted to, um, and then go in there and, and you know manually modify those properties. Um, but I don't want to do that. That's that that's just that's too much work for me. So um, I'm going to use a uh, command line utility called sed to do an inline edit. So I'm basically going to change the default um, right from a command line statement. Okay. And so um, looking at this file, we see that we have a variable uh, here that's called database name here. We have username here and then password here, okay? And then we can leave the MySQL host name as localhost. That's fine because we actually are running uh, WordPress right on, uh, the, or I'm sorry, MySQL on the localhost. So I really just need three lines to, uh, you know, basically modify those three properties. And so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to, again, uh, make a little comment and we're gonna do an edit the WP config file and what I'm gonna do is uh, again run and I'm gonna use said and I'm gonna use two switches I and E for inline edit okay and let me just uh, let me move this up so you guys can see it a little bit better here and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say um, S for substitution and then your your forward slash here is going to be the like the, del the delimiter essentially, right? So I'm saying like I want to do a substitution. That's what an S is. I'm going to put the first thing that I want to substitute slash what I want to substitute it with slash and then a G for all occurrences, okay? And so um, what I want to uh, change here is going to be di is again if I take a look at an example of my WP config, I want database name here, right? So I'm going to copy that. That's exactly how it is set up in the uh, in the WP config file, and let's go ahead and paste it, and put my delimiter. And what I want to change that with is going to be WordPress because that's what we named our database when we set it up inside of the uh, in the SQL file, right? And again, I'm just going to do a slash g and my quote, and then I have to specify what file I want to modify, which in this case is var www.html wordpress wp config.php. Okay, and now. I'm going to need, whoops, again, we're going to just do this in one one uh, one foul swoop. So I'm just going to copy this whole said statement right here because most of this is going to be correct. And I'm going to paste it not once, but two more times so that I can modify the three properties that I need to. Okay. In my second one, again, I'm going to go down over here and we're going to get rid of this database name. And what I'm going to, I'm going to bring my, my sample back over here and I'm going to copy the second property which is going to be the uh, username so where it says username here I'll paste that in and we used WP whoops not caps WP user okay and again we just might want to consult our my SQL file that we created, we did WP user with a password of password, okay? So, let's go back down here. And so, as you can guess, the third and last piece that we're going to change is where it says database name here. here let's grab password here and we're gonna put in the password all right and that should be all we need now I will say actually this is probably a bad password um, I think I think the app will fly but sometimes the at symbol uh, will screw it up and also don't ever use a a backslash in your password never ever ever and the reason why is because the in Linux um, the backslash is actually an escape character so if I put that as the password um, my SQL would actually think that the password would be capital P at S S O R D it would actually omit the W because the escape character is there so don't ever ever do that 
Um, so let's see. Uh, I think that probably is about all we need. We, at that point, have installed the application, installed the database. Um, we have set the properties or the WP config file so that the WordPress can connect to the database. Um, and I think that's all we need. So let's go ahead and give it a try. Um, all we need to do now is quit this file. And um, once we quit, then we can do a build. And the way that we're going to actually build this, this file is I am going to do a Docker build. And we're going to do a dash T, which is just going to be a tag. And the tag is what I want to name this as. So I'm going to do this as, uh, uh, let's say, dot core um, slash WordPress. And then I'm going to specify dot, meaning that the I'm basically telling Docker that I want to build dot core slash WordPress. That's the image name and the, the space. Um, and the Docker file is located in the current directory. So I go ahead and hit go. And... If it doesn't already have uh, the app container CentOS 065 or whatever base image that you're using, it will go out and it will pull it down. Which so it looks like I, I don't have it. So um, now it's going ahead and it's it's pulling it down. All right, and now as you can see, uh, it's going through and it's it's literally do, providing the steps, going through and walking through that Docker file, everything that we set up here. So you know, maintainer set that, and then it's you know again you can see intermediate container. So it builds a new container, it runs the statement. Right now it's running the yum update, so it's going to go through yum, do the yum update, install the packages that we wanted, um, and then you know remove that cache and commit it. Okay, and it's done. However, um, as we can see here, it actually gave us, we're going to kind of like scan back through. It says it built the container successfully, but uh, there was actually, okay, so this was just uh, downloading the file, so that's fine. It grabbed the file, um, went back down, and let's see here. So it skipped unknown instruction MySQL uh, right here. Okay, so we need to figure out why it skipped that because um, that's obviously a, an important uh, instruction. Otherwise, it didn't set up the database. So let's go ahead and open up that Docker file again. And let's take a look at the MySQL line and see why it didn't. Ah, and the reason why it didn't was because I actually had a comment section here, right? So I need to get rid of that. And I think I had meant to say run my SQL install. Okay, so let's go ahead and save that. And uh, we already built the uh, the container. Um, however, we should have all the uh, the files there. So let's go to, let's see, if we do a Docker images now, um, we'll see that we've actually got uh, this dot core right here. So it actually went and it grabbed the app container CentOS 065 image, um, which is, that's the raw. Uh, actually grabbed this guy right here. All right, so there's my base. And then it did build uh, the container. However, um, I've made a modification. So we can use caching to speed this up, right? I, I don't want to remove this image quite yet. Because there is a list. If I actually do a, a Docker images dash dash tree, I can actually see all the steps that were taken during the installation, all the different containers that were built, right? And this is where the caching piece comes in handy. Um, because we already went through most of those steps, like the yum update and all that, we can actually use the existing containers that were already there uh, to kind of rebuild that image, right? They're already kind of cached. So what I can do is just run that Docker build again, um, and I'm going to call this Docker build... Um, I might actually just be able to name it the same thing. Let's see. Yeah, so there we go. So see, it, it sped right through all that other stuff because it already had done that. It was able to basically just grab an intermediary container um, that had last, you know, finished 
finished correctly before we made our modification to our Docker file, start off there, run MySQL, start up MySQL, apply the stuff, and then rebuild the image, right? So now we've successfully got uh, the image rebuilt, and it should be 6619. That's what should, should be the image number. So if I do a Docker images again, um, we'll see that I've got a 6619 here now. And so this should be my image. And I can actually remove this one. So I can do a Docker RMI and we'll remove this guy, which is just a unknown tagged one. No big deal. It's a leftover from the previous image. Okay. So let's see. Let's take a look. And there we go. So uh, now we've got the WordPress uh, image. Let's go ahead and spin this thing up and see if it actually worked. The way that we're going to do that is we can issue a boot to Docker IP statement, and that will give us our boot to Docker IP address. Okay. And in order to run the WordPress, all I'm going to do is do a Docker run, and I'm going to do a dash IT for run interactively. And then I am going to um, specify a couple of things here. I'm going to name it WordPress. I'm going to give it a host name so that inside the container, instead of having just a random container ID, it'll actually have a, a host name. Um, and I'm going to name that WordPress. I'm going to publish the port, which was 80. So I'm going to say I want the host port, my boot to Docker IP, to translate back to the container I, uh, port of, of port 80. So basically publish that port. And I want to run the doc core new WordPress image. And I'm going to just put bin bash as the, uh, as the command that I wanted to run. That will kind of bring us to the command line. So um, another way that I can do this is I can actually add a dash D in here. But I want to see this thing spin up for the first time. So um, if I did a dash D, it would kind of run in the background. And I wouldn't you know, actually see the live boot up of the container as it's happening. But let's go ahead and run that. And I've already got that port allocated um, on another container. So... I'm just going to change this to port 81 uh, because I, I, I'm already using, unfortunately, I, I can't delete that container that's using port 80 right now, um, but I can just map it to port 81. So now I'm saying port 81 on my, my boot to Docker IP will translate back to 80. So let's go ahead and it had already actually started. So we, we got to clean this up for a minute here. So docker remove this temporary container which correlated to the first WordPress instance and rerun okay and then we see it starting up and so aha so one thing that we actually forgot to do we see that we started NTP we started uh, syslogger we started cron D however we are inside of the container now I didn't start HTTPD. So um, we want to, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to fix that. I'm going to exit out of the container. I'm going to look at the running containers. I'm going to remove this container. Whoops. And we're going to edit the Docker file. So now if I do a Docker PS dash dash all again, you'll see that I'm only running my Laravel project that I was working on. Uh, Docker images, we see that you know we've got the same images, no problem. I'm going to edit my Docker file one more time here. And at the end, I'm going to start Apache. And really, I'm going to want Apache and MySQL to start every single time. So I'm actually not going to start it that way. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to use the same trick that I used that I was saying when I was showing you the base image. And what that is is going to be start MySQL and Apache on boot. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm just going to do a run echo service MySQL D start to the dot bash RC. Okay. And I'm going to do the same thing for 
HTTPD. All right, so we're just adding those two lines, and then what that's going to do is it's going to echo these two, basically put service MySQL start and service HTTPD start into the bash RC, which will get ran every single time the container starts. So that way we know that when the container starts, uh, uh, MySQL and Apache will both uh, be started up and be running. So let's go ahead and save that, and then we'll just do another rebuild. And um, you'll get used to it. Um, you know, you'll, you'll probably build an image five or six or seven times before you get it right. Okay, so that was really quick because, again, it was able to use some caching. Um, if we do Docker images, we're going to have this untagged old 6619 image, so we're going to want to remove that. This is a Docker RMI. Let's get rid of that old image. Okay. And now we can just go ahead and we'll again clear the screen. We'll just go back up. We'll use that same run line that we used before to relaunch it. And now we'll see MySQL started and uh, HTTP, HTTPD it gave us this could not determine fully qualified server name, but that's fine. It's uh, just a warning. Um, we could fix that as well, but we don't necessarily need to. Um, so, but now we've got Apache running. MySQL is running. So let's go ahead and uh, actually see. Um, and before that, let me just uh, show you that file here. If we look at the, the .bashrc, which is where we're putting that stuff, um, all it is is basically setting up your environment, and it's got the three lines that uh, I have already appended inside of my base image along with the two new lines that we just added, which were basically every time that the container starts up to go ahead and start MySQL and, and Apache. So let me uh, let me go ahead and open up uh, a new window here and see if I can remember my boot to Docker IP it was this guy and we're on port 81. So let's see if we've got some love. And we do not. We are not getting to the thing, so let's make sure that we uh, installed that into the correct place. So inside of our WordPress image, let's take a look now. If I look at my etsy hdbd conf.d wordpress.conf file, let's take a look at this. We're looking at our document root. And so the reason why this probably didn't come up uh, looking at this actually is, let's see, everything is owned by root, and our Apache sir, our Apache is going to be running uh, as the user Apache. So if we take a look again, uh, let's see, we'll cat etsy httpd conf um, httpd.conf grep user, and if we look yeah, so the user that Apache is running under is Apache. The group is going to be Apache, so that means that we need to set the permissions. So again, I'm just going to go ahead and exit this out and remove that container. So docker ps dash dash all and docker remove the container and go back to our docker file. And let's see, so we are going to just set permissions on that directory. Uh, set permissions. All right, and so the way that we're going to set permissions is we're going to do a run again, just a chone dash r for recursive, and we're going to set this to Apache Apache and var www html WordPress. And then we are also going to chmod 775-r, the same directory. Okay, so that will set the permissions. And let's go ahead and give that a shot. So again, we'll quit. 
we will rebuild. Do the same thing. There we go. Docker images. Remove the the non-tagged image. And rerun the container. So see what's nice about using the cache is that it's really quick because most of our stuff, and that's exactly why we keep that that revision history. That's a uh, really good, um, this is a really good example as to why, you know, we want that caching there because when we have to rebuild our images, we don't have to go through all that, that entire process all over again. So um, let's go ahead and oops, move this. And we're still getting the, okay. And now we can check and see, actually, I see an error right here. Could not resolve hostname start out 80 ignoring. Name or service not known. Oh. So the reason is actually the patch config file we messed up. So let's go ahead and just one more edit. <laughs> let's get rid of this guy again. Oops. Okay, and we need to edit the WordPress config file. It should actually be colon 80, not dot 80. So that was a typo on my behalf, trying to go too fast. And I'm not sure if a rebuild in this case is going to work. Oops, that's not going to work. So it actually did detect that, so that's good. So again, let's just get rid of our cruft. All right, excellent. And run our container again all right now we got rid of that error message so now we see now we just have the fully qualified domain name and now if we drag this guy over one more time and we hit refresh now we should be good to go so there's our installation so you're definitely gonna you know want to watch some typos I was trying to go a little fast to try to you know get this uh, get, go through this process as quickly as possible but um, and that ends up resulting in having to rebuild a couple of times but now uh, we have this thing, it's up and it's running. Um, and now what's nice is that, you know, initially that takes a little bit longer than, you know, WordPress's wonderful five minute install. But now that we've got this container up and running, you'll see that like if I go to my, you know, my instance here and I've got it running on port 81, I can actually just um, go back over here. And if I want to get out of this, uh, I'm, I'm in my container here. So I'm just going to hit uh, control P and then control Q. And that will get me back to my CLI. Um, and if I do a Docker PS, you'll see that I've got the WordPress running. Um, but what's nice now is that if I want to run a second instance of this, I can actually go ahead and just, I got to change the name. I got to change the host name and I got to change the port that I'm running on, right? But then I can run a second instance. And now if I bring back that, uh, that thing, we open up a new tab. and I go to port 82, we have a second WordPress instance running, no problem, like five seconds. So um, how's that for your five minute install there, WordPress? We have to put up, up a little bit of, uh, you know, put a little bit of, uh, of effort into the initial uh, setup, but then once it's set up, uh, we are good to go. So I could literally walk through this thing, um, you know, set it all up and install it. Um, I'm not gonna do that though. So um, really quickly, I guess, uh, uh, I think what we'll do is I'll actually cut the um, you know some of the customization stuff into another video uh, maybe next week 
because um, there's actually quite a bit to cover there. I, I actually have a way to make uh, the Apache config file dynamic, um, and then we can kind of feed it using environment variables, um, and then we can also s customize and set up. So I guess we can we can look at it real quick here. Let me see if I got uh, still got the page up. Uh, if I look inside of like the WordPress instance that uh, whoops that I have, um, and let's actually look at it from this perspective here. So go to my WordPress. You'll see that I've actually got a couple of other files that I've added into the project, like this run config, um, and I also, I also set up environment variables. So if you look at my Docker file. Um, I set these n, n variables right here, which are basically environment variables or default values, right? And I can override those with certain switches. So when I launch my Docker run, I can actually do it with these dash E commands and override, um, you know, some of the, the uh, default values that I've already set. So like, for instance, if I want to set the application name or the uh, MySQL root password or the connection parameters for, you know, uh, the user that WordPress is going to use to connect to the database, I can go ahead and do that. And the way that I'm getting around that is that uh, I uh, actually, in my run, I have a run config file, and that run config file does a bunch of different stuff, right? So it will go through and it actually edits the uh, original Apache config file and it sets up the application name so I don't get that error um, initially. I go through and then I, uh, I set my permissions um, you know, I, I go through and I uh, change the Apache config name or the Apache config name so that it matches what my application name is. Um, and then I go through and I actually take that MySQL file that we created, um, and instead of actually putting hard coded values in there, I'll put uh, just like the uh, WordPress uh, example file. I'll put like um, connection string or variables that I'm going to reassign. So like I have root password here, database name here, my SQL host name here, and then I use that same trick. I just said, um, you know, I grab the environment variable and I said that value with what's in the environment variable. Um, and then I do the same thing for a couple of different parameters for the WP config. Um, and I set the, uh, uh, I do some other stuff here where I'm basically assigning values to uh, the slash Etsy sysconfig HTTPD file and those values are able to be passed into Apache. And then in my Apache config file, for instance, um, I actually use variables, right? So I can say like, you know, server name is server name app. And that's getting it again just from that value that I'm passing in. So what this all does for me is it basically makes the application completely dynamic. And so, you know, when I when I start up a WordPress instance, I can actually specify a root password, you know, a username and a password that um, uh, WordPress is going to use to uh, connect to the WordPress instance. Um, I can, you know, set up the app name. So, you know, www.mynewwordpressblog.com. I can have all that set up uh, right off the bat, right from the run command. And, uh, and then I'm, I'm up and going and, and ready to fly. So um, you can definitely do a lot more. Um, I just wanted to kind of run through what was involved in actually using a Docker file uh, to set up the installation and set up the process. Um, the last thing before we cut out here is I, I've got all this uh, set up and I like the way that it is. So the last thing that I would do, um, and I'm just going to walk through the steps real quick, is I would do a get init. Whoops which would uh, basically create a get repository. I would go to my Bitbucket. I would create a new repository. I would feed in the add get, you know, um, remote, or I should say remote add origin. Um, and then I would do a, you know, get add all, right? Get add all, get commit, dash M, WordPress container, build, and then get push, origin origin master okay and that obviously I don't have this connected to a, uh, a repository but what, what that will do is uh, that will do exactly what we've done here right so it will give you a repository where you'd be able to have all this stuff in a version control and that way you'd be able to pull it down and you could you know modify it later or whatever or just even have it for reference um, and this way you don't really need to keep your container because you could you know always just pull down the build file and rebuild it so um, that's probably pretty much all that there is to it. Um, next time around, uh, maybe you know we'll go into some some more complicated stuff. Um, I definitely have lots and lots and lots of of Docker material. I've been 
eating, sleeping, and living Docker for the last uh, couple of months. Um, so, you know, I've, I've done quite a bit with it. Uh, some service discovery stuff will be coming up, um, how to do some DNS stuff, more complicated setups using, uh, you know, uh, volume-only containers and uh, linking containers together, um, you know, maybe even uh, revisiting this WordPress instance and maybe separating the database out, um, things like that. And I might even walk through kind of maybe the process of making this customizable so that it's kind of laid out um, a lot better than, you know, just talking about it for a couple of minutes. But um, that'll about wrap it up for tonight. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, if you did, please check out my other videos and hit the subscribe button below. Um, also, I have a whole other slew of videos on, uh, on you know, formatc.com as well as .core.com. Um, so check out both of those. And if you guys would like to request anything specific, um, you know, maybe how to do something in Docker or um, I'm still working on some coding stuff. Uh, I do application installs, like anything that you guys want to, you know, request, uh, please, you know, shoot me a comment and uh, I'll, I'll see if I can accommodate. Uh, other than that, thanks for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed and we will catch you next time. Thanks.